So that's, a, that's an Isle Royale moose, actually. So you'll see a number of, of Isle Royale images. So my job is to talk about the humanities, or at least the non-art humanities. I'm the, I think, sole representative of, uh, <laughs> and I can't represent them all. So I'm talking about philosophy, ethics, environmental ethics, religion, creative writing, literature, uh, history. Writing. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, mine. Uh, so if I look at the way the humanities are described and the, the methods that we bring to bear on topics, and I'm sort of condensing some definitions here. Uh, the suggestion is that what we do is we employ subjective and rational methods as opposed to objective and empirical methods. Rational analysis, emotional insight, imagination to investigate. We're interested in investigation, evidently, uh, and specifically the human world. Um, that's, our, that's our purview. Then when I look at, I condensed our, our grand challenge, uh, and I, I like this very much. Uh, how do we apply the different tools, worldviews, and philosophies of these disciplines, and I think we mean all of the disciplines, uh, to envision and solve complex problems? The challenge we have is that when we look at the methods that our various disciplines, all of them, employ, solving complex problems isn't really what, we're, what we do. We understand things. We pursue and investigate things. Maybe we respond to things. But the idea that our job from disciplines is to solve complex problems is something we hear a lot about, but it's a relatively new thing, and it's not something we're trained to do. It's not even clear we're trained to recognize what problems actually are. But I think it's an important topic to take on. I think this is exactly the work that we should be doing, and it's because of the time in which we live. We live, as many people have mentioned, at an extraordinary time, a decisive pinpoint uh, in, in history. The rest of time will hinge upon this point. It's incredible if we think about the, the near future, all of the things that are actually going to play out in our lifetimes. Incredible to think that we will live to see the end of one way of life on the earth and the emergence of another. Now, whether it's the emergence of a way of life based on intelligence and plain good sense, or whether it's the emergence of a degraded and dangerous slide into what? We don't know. We can't imagine. So what do we do about that? It's a problem. What do we do about it? Well, the first thing we can do is just think about little lessons. I always think about things my mother told me. Uh, and she always told me that the first thing you should do is tell the truth. So maybe we should start with some truth telling. Uh, truth telling about our current context, our current situation, and the realities that we actually face. And especially what kind of a problem it is that we face. Now, some of this truth-telling is the job of, of science, absolutely. But the premise behind what I really want to say to you uh, is that climate change and other environmental problems, they certainly are scientific problems, no doubt. They are technological problems, certainly. They're economic issues, absolutely. And they're survival issues, we know that. But fundamentally, they are moral issues, and they call for a moral response. So my colleague Kathleen Dean Moore and I are both philosophers and moral philosophers, and we realize that in this conversation about climate change and other environmental concerns, that that dimension of the conversation is com was completely lacking. Uh, and so as good academics, when we find something's lacking, if there's a gap, there, you must need a big fat book to fill that gap. Uh, so in 2010, what we did is we set out to query the world's moral leaders. Who are the people in the world that other people look to for moral guidance, whether they come from religion or, or business or philosophy or poetry or whomever? Who are those people? So we asked 100 of the world's moral leaders. We just asked them a really simple question. Is it wrong to wreck the world? <laughs> Not is it stupid or is it, does it, would it cost us a lot of money, but is it wrong? Uh, in other words, another way to phrase that is, you know, why, was my, why must we save the world in all its richness and promise? And what are the moral principles, the deep values, the conscientious refusals, the ideals, the visions of a way of life that are actually worthy of us as moral beings? And can you tell us in about 1,500 words, uh, if it's wrong to wreck the world, why? And 1,500 words, please. People didn't like that last part. Uh, these people are used to many more words. <clears throat> so we collected these in a book called Moral Ground. There's a copy of it in the, in, in the back. Um, 
And it was, the, you know, the motivation was that that was a part of the conversation that was disastrously missing from the public discourse. And we thought that it, that has, that's going to have disastrous consequences. Unless we make this into a moral issue, we're not going to actually make headway on this. That this was a missing piece. Um, and the reason that we realized it was a missing piece is mostly because of all the time we spent with our, our science colleagues and the work that they were trying to do in the world. You know, we, we sometimes say, uh, or seem to believe, that if we have more information, that will lead to action. There's actually a, this is called the information deficit model of behavior change. Um, that if I can increase information, that will lead to action. We say things like, if people only knew, if they only knew what we were doing to the world, they would act. If they only knew the impacts of their actions, they would mend their ways. If science could only show them the relevant facts. Then we decided that that probably is going to turn out to be the saddest and most dangerous statement in all of human history at the end of the day, of all the sad and dangerous statements that are contenders. Um, that's going to turn out to be the worst one. It's a practical mistake. We know practically it doesn't actually work that way. Our knowledge of the world has increased, but our actions on behalf of that world have not increased. So it's a practical mistake. And that we realized that as a, it was a practical mistake because it's actually a logical mistake at the end of the day. That facts, science alone, are, are in fact not enough. So this is just an argument. We're philosophers, so we think about arguments all the time. That's all I think about. Everything's P1 and P2 and C and conclusions and inferences. Uh, this is the practical syllogism. This is just an illustration of, of this point, that the idea here is that any argument that attempts to reach a conclusion that suggests that we ought to do something, that we ought to act in a certain way, has to, as a matter of logic, this is from Aristotle. You're not going to mess with Aristotle. Uh, it has to, as a principle of logic, have two kinds of, of premises. In order to draw conclusions about acting, you have to do the work not only of the first premise, the empirical work, this is how the world is, this is what the future might look like, but you have to do the work of the second premise as well. As a culture, we're really good at the first premise and we're really not very good at, at the second premise. We go to all kinds of lengths to avoid having the conversation about the second premise. But we have to. I mean, as a matter of logic, you have to. You cannot arrive at that conclusion without doing that work. So we have to talk about what we most deeply value. We have to talk about what ideals move us and what we hope for our children and for the future. We have to talk ab about, we have to find ways to talk about what we believe in and what we even gulp love. So one of the things that's happened since 2010, and I'm not suggesting a, a causation here, only a correlation, is that we have seen the emergence of, of moral language uh, in, the, in the sort of climate change discussion, most recently in the Pope's encyclic, which is just full of, of moral calls to action. Uh, and we've seen it from everybody. We've seen it from scientists. James Hansen says that this is a moral issue. Uh, we've seen it from religious leaders. Desmond Tutu calls it a moral challenge. The Dalai Lama says that a clean environment is a human right and it's our responsibility uh, to make sure this happens. We've even seen it when the Rockefeller Brothers Fund divested from fossil fuels, which remember were partly brought to us by the Rockefeller Brothers, uh, their, one of their justifications was that this is a moral imperative. Uh, it doesn't matter how much it costs, it doesn't matter how painful it is, it's just wrong. Uh, and we have to act otherwise. Probably most powerfully, uh, I always measure power by when things show up in Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, so Bill McKibben in Rolling Stone magazine comes to the conclusion that the more carefully you do the math, the more thoroughly you realize that this is, at bottom, a moral issue. Even Naomi Klein, of all people, has sort of recognized that we're not going to win this as bean counters. We're going to win this by appealing to, to moral arguments. So what do I mean? Uh, there were 100 essays came in. They, they tended to fall in about 14 different categories, 14 different reasons why people thought that we have this affirmative obligation. Uh, and I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. Daniel Quinn wrote for us. Um, some of you know his work in Ishmael and other books. And he said, of course we have an obligation uh, to the future to leave a world as rich in life and possibility as the world was left to us. Of course we do. For the sake of our own survival, we have that obligation. And he writes, he says, says it this way. He says, look, we're, we're like people who are living in the penthouse of a hundred story building. Every day we go downstairs and at random knock out 150 bricks to take upstairs to increase the size of our penthouse. Since the building below consists of millions of bricks, this seems hardless enough for a single day. 
but for 30,000 days? Eventually, inevitably, the streams of vacancy we have created in the fabric of the walls below will come together to produce a complete structural collapse. When that happens, we will join the general collapse, and our lofty position at the top of the structure will not save us. So you can take expressions like that, and you can maybe make them boring by turning them into arguments. Uh, but they're arguments. He's making an argument that looks something like this. It has a claim about the world, a factual claim, but it has to have this sort of value assumption. This is not a very controversial one, that, that human survival is of deep value, but it, but it must be there. We must be able to articulate that. Another example, lots of uh, writers wrote about um, obligations to future generations and obligations to children and obligations to uh, the promises that we make to children. So this is illustrated nicely by a, a recent event, the, the Executive Sec Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, Christiana uh, Figueres of Costa Rica, was brought to tears uh, over the moral implications of climate change. And she put it this way, just sort of welling up. She said, it's so completely unfair and immoral what we are doing to future generations. We are condemning them before they are even born. And we have a choice about it. That's the point. We have a choice. If, if it were inevitable, then so be it. But we have a choice to change the future we are going to give to children. So again, this is a, 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 the climate crisis is a betrayal of, of love, we might say. The proof of love is that you can make an argument out of something. At least for a philosopher, it is. So an argument could look something, something like this. So again, 100 different kinds of arguments, 14 different kinds of, of, of moral appeals uh, are, are made. I, I said that our culture is, we struggle with moral affirmations. We're good at science and not so good at, at values. But at the same time, the moral affirmation is a great American uh, tradition. If you look back historically, almost every time when, the, when our country turned on a dime, when our country made great social and cultural turnings, it was because of the building pressure of a moral conviction. So the forces that created the American Revolution, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And what are those truths? The great moral principles about human equality and freedom. The emancipation of the slaves, based on a shared idea about what is human decency and what is not. Civil rights movement, I have a dream of what? not of a growth economy, not of new technologies or iPhones in every ear, uh, but of justice and compassion and opportunity. So this is where we're at with this now. The, we thought uh, that that was a great thing to be able to do is sort of say, hey, this is a moral issue. People seem to have responded. And then the next question is, so what do I do about that? If we're not very good at ethics or values, the idea of taking a moral affirmation and then turning it in, in, into the way we live in the world is, a, is another, another challenge. So we might say, well, okay, I get it. It's a, it's a moral problem, so what can I do? Um, the first thing to recognize is that we have a choice. Every single one of us, every person makes a decision about how they live their life. Uh, and every person makes a decision about whether or not they are people of integrity or not. And when I say integrity, I mean this very literally. Integrity, integer, wholeness. This is where we match what we know about the world and what we claim we value about the world with how we actually live in that world. So this is where we refuse to oscillate between the disempowerment of, of hope as a motivator and its alternative of, of despair, that we decide to be people of integrity. So if our cultural forces, uh, the, uh, our, our cult I'm sorry, if our culture forces us to live in ways that we actually do not believe in, in ways that are destructive, then we have no choice but to change that culture, which we can do. We've done this before. We can do it in at least one of two ways. We can do it in what we might think of as a more negative way, and we can do it in a positive way. The negative path, given the urgency of the challenge, might be where we need to start. If we're going to live lives of integrity, matching what we do with what we believe is right, then we're, there are certain things we're just going to absolutely have to refuse to do, understanding, of course, that there are costs to that refusal. Every decision we make, as consumers, for instance, about where we find our information, about where we get our food, about what we wear, about how we make our living, every single one of those decisions, how we invest our time and our wealth, how we travel, how we keep ourselves warm and sheltered, those are opportunities for us to express our, our value, our, our integrity. 
Every belief we have serves someone or something. We often don't think of our beliefs in this way. Our beliefs serve someone or something. So we have to ask ourselves, when I believe something, who or what does it serve? Does it serve forces of light and nurturing and love or forces of darkness and desperation? We have many opportunities to say, I know that's what you want me to buy or do or believe or invest in, but I don't believe in that and I'm not going to participate. So that's step one, we have to get our house in order. And step two though, I think our affirmations, and this is where I really see the science, arts, and humanities coming together. I don't think we can have this affirmation without, without all of us. So refusal is, is not enough, and I think we all know that. Um, at the same time that we refuse, we have to imagine a different future, a different world. We need something more, something that's not just sort of grief stricken. We need to find ways to imagine or, or, or to, to live in a different future, to make our lives into works of art, for instance, that express our deepest values, the arts and humanities coming together, but also to make sure that those images about the future are actually consistent with the facts of the working world, which is information we would, we would get from the sciences. So as we live with integrity, we imagine and we bring into being new ways of living on the land that are bright with art and imagination nested into families and communities, grateful and, and joyous. That I don't think can be done. That imagination of the future can be done, can be accomplished without the sort of might of, of all of these disciplines working together. And eventually I think what happens is you just stop seeing these as, as disciplines over time. That's all I wanna say. <laughs>